Hello and welcome. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about self-hosting. And if you're not sure what self-hosting is, this is the introductory video that's going to explain not only what it is, but some reasons why you might want to start doing it. First of all, let's start with what is self-hosting? There's a lot of nuance to this and we're not going to get into everything. But to keep it simple, self-hosting is running your own server in your own house so that you can deploy services that you're in full control of and not have to rely on a third party for those services and not have to worry about your data or your privacy. Here I am looking at my dashboard, but we're just going to quickly go over some of my favorite ones. The first one here is Airsonic, and this gives me access to all my music on any device, no matter where I am, as long as I have an internet connection. The next one here is called Trillium. It's for taking notes. I really like how it gives you this map overview of all your different notes. So you can kind of dig down into whatever note you're looking for. You can see how I have things arranged for my garage, all the different vehicles in there. If I want to have a note on a specific vehicle, I can just click into that vehicle and take a quick note on it. Same for like my videos. You know, this is the this is the outline that I'm working on for this specific video right now. And it's just a very nice and organized way to keep track of your notes. Here's Paperless NGX. This is for keeping track and scanning all your receipts, your manuals. You can just put your PDFs in here, um, your tax records, anything that you want to have as far as your paperwork is concerned. Instead of having a huge filing cabinet stuffed full of files, you can digitize them. And this does also OCR. You'll be able to search for a word. If that word shows up in the scan, it will pull it up and find it. You could just type in like 2022 tax record right now and it would pull up my 2022 tax record. Images. If you use Google Photos, Apple Photos, this can take its place. You have control over it. You can see easily get to any date you want. You can type in motorcycle. It'll show you all your motorcycles. Uh, it does face recognition. And here's DocuWiki. This is your own personal wiki that you can keep track of your information with. We can take a look at some of the things I keep track of in my wiki. I keep track of all the maintenance and records of my vehicles. Here you can see for the Grand Marquis, I have the build spec sheet. And this just gives you all the recalls. I can click on them and fix anything that I may see fit there and I also keep track of different common parts so you can see oil I have listed filter wipers fuel filter air filter whether or not I have them and some common maintenance records that need to be done frequently I have listed at the top here and I also keep notes of you know like things I need to reference so 16 millimeter drain plug instead of Climbing under there with a couple of sockets in my hand, I know take the 16 millimeter with me. Um, my scheduled maintenance that's coming up is going to be 100,000 miles. If I click on that, it gives me all my mile markers and the maintenance that I need to do at the, that time. So you can see here, um, that's also readily available for me. And then just a, a log of everything that I've done at, with the miles and the date and you can see all the different things there same for my other vehicles so here's the 1100 you can see all the different parts that I've replaced and that I've keep track of over the years and you know the records the log same deal for all my vehicles I also keep track of recipes uh, tech so you can see Linux stuff server stuff Android stuff it's just nice to have a reference to a lot of these different things. Now, why self-host? For me, it comes down to two big reasons. One is control. You have the freedom to customize and configure your services the way that you want them and the way that fits your own specific needs. The other thing is, since you control it, you do not need to worry about the service shutting down at some point or changing associated costs or their other policies regarding your data, you have full control over everything. And the second reason is privacy and security. If you are in control of your own data, then you know 
how it's stored, and who it's transmitted to. Now, what do you need to get started? Well, you need some piece of hardware to actually run your server on. That can be a single board computer, like a Raspberry Pi, or an Odroid, or a Rock Pro 64. You can go out and buy a legit server off of eBay, or you can use any old PC or laptop that's sitting around your closet. There's pluses and minuses to every platform. A few years ago, I would have recommended to go out and get a single board computer, but because of prices and formats, bottlenecks, and the CPU architecture that they normally run on, which is ARM, I don't really recommend single board computers any longer. My recommendation would be either use that old PC or laptop in your closet or that's laying around wherever you have it, or go out and buy a small form factor computer off of eBay. You can get a used ThinkCenter M93P or something similar to that for right around $100. It has x86 CPU architecture. It also has QuickSync, which aids in its ability to transcode videos if you want to set up like a Jellyfin server to stream movies and videos and transcode them to other devices. That's why my recommendation for most people is get a small form factor computer. Get a tiny mini micro type PC off of eBay for around $100 and you're off to the races. The next thing that you need to consider is your storage needs. That means if you select a small form factor computer like I recommend, you hook up two two terabyte drives to it or two eight terabyte drives, whatever is gonna accommodate your needs for storage, then that's gonna take care of your needs for making proper backups. Because when I start getting into making proper backups, you're gonna need a second device to do that on and that's gonna require a completely separate hard drive. The next topic I'm gonna to be going over is the operating system. And just like with hardware, there's a lot of different options that you can choose from for your operating system. I don't want people to get too overwhelmed with all the choices that you can make. So understand that I'm going to narrow it down and I am again going to be making my own recommendation. I just want to take a cursory look over all the different options. If you have a different fit or a different need than the path that I'm going to be going down, you can take a look into that yourself. So the first thing we have here is TP Umbrella Castle OS. These are very easy to set up and they're meant for beginners that don't want to have to think much about their setup. If that sounds like you, give this a try. But just be warned that they have very limited tooling and if, if you do want to eventually do more advanced things, you're going to run into a wall and you might be able to get around that wall, but it's going to require more effort to get around it than it would be to have a more open platform. The next thing that we have here is Unraid. And Unraid is also very easy to use. A lot of beginners use it. However, it does require licensing. It requires you to boot from a DRM to USB. Basically, you gotta use one of your USBs and turn it into DRM garbage. And it costs money, so you have to pay for it. And when you wanna add drives to it, you have to pay more to add drives to it. It doesn't offer any benefit over my recommendation of Open Media Vault, so I just overlooked this completely. Yes, one of the key features of Onraid is you can have mismatched drive sizes, but you can do that with Open Media Vault as well using something like SnapRaid. So I don't recommend Onraid. The next thing we have here is TrueNAS Scale. And TrueNAS Skill is primarily focused on large data pools, and it has an excellent ZFS support, which is going to provide you with really good data integrity. The downside of that is ZFS loves to gobble up RAM, and it's not as easy to expand your storage without additional consideration. If you're thinking of upgrading your data pool, it may be a bigger expense and more consideration than some of these other options. And then we have Proxmox. And with Proxmox, you can manage multiple machines, uh, VMs, Linux containers. The downside of that is you do need to configure your resources of all these individual VMs and Linux containers. And it just requires more configuration in general. Now there are user scripts available to help you get a lot of these things set up. And it 
does make it super easy to set these things up. However, it's hard to recommend them because you're running a script into Bash from an online source, and that is not a good practice. And as a beginner, you don't want to get used to doing that. You should understand the scripts that you're running, and you really should read through them and not just run them directly from an online source. I wouldn't want to get a beginner into that kind of practice and bad habits, so I would not recommend using those scripts unless you do understand them. And then that'll bring us to the last one, which is my recommendation. It's Open Media Vault. The reason that I recommend it is that it is built for small offices and small business environments, and that translates almost perfectly into most self hosted environments. Now, the downside of Open Media Vault is its user interface is a bit clunky. It's not as intuitive as Unraid or TrueNAS. Now on the flip side of that, usually it's more efficient anyway to accomplish tasks in the terminal. So just get used to using the terminal and I'm gonna show you how. These are my recommendations so far. Small form factor computer off of eBay for $100 if you don't already have something sitting in your closet. And then you install Open Media Vault on it and then you follow along with the rest of my videos. Hopefully that simplifies things for you. But, you know, if you have other needs, consider some of these other options. But this is going to be the route that I go with these videos in this series. That's going to do it for this video. I am going to put a link in the description to an article, or it is more of an outline that I used when making this video. If you are interested in going into the weeds a little bit and seeing a little more detail to some of the, the different options that you have available here, check that out. Otherwise, the next video in this series is going to be setting up Open Media Vault right off of a fresh installation, the steps that I go through to get it set up for a self-hosting environment. Stay tuned for that, and as always, thank you for watching, and have a nice day.